Your life can change. It doesn't have to stay the same. You can break through to another level. You can experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower you to live beyond limits. So this morning, you know, we like to share a little bit about, or I do, maybe my husband does, and I like to share and let you know a little bit about what goes on in our home. <laughs> but as for those of you that saw our Mother's Day episode, or I say it was an episode, I guess, where we had uh, Slade and Sydney, and they had to answer questions about their mother. And one of them was, what is the thing that... Um, upsets your dad the most, <laughs> or your mom does, it irritates your dad. And I mean, without even pausing, they both said, she orders on Amazon <laughs> all the time, which I said, it's not just for me. I'm buying things for everybody. But uh, we have this little clip that I wanted to show you. You know, it's good to have fun in church, right? Right. So this is just a little clip. The, this is not us. These are actors we hired to play us. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, baby girl. Yes, baby. Hey, can I see your phone? Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm going to look through your phone and search everything. Why would I care? I'm your wife. You're my husband. You trust me. I trust you. You trust me, right? I do. Okay, baby. All right, let me pull up this Amazon Prime account then. My what? Your Amazon Prime account. So, that may be how it truly really is. <laughs> Ashley saw that and sent it to me. She's like, I thought you would enjoy this. So, I thought everyone else would too, but anyway, well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're going to talk today about being thankful and thankful for God's word, God's house, and let's just pray. Father God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for another opportunity to come into the house of the Lord, to worship you, Father God. And I just thank you, Father, as I speak today that, Father, you're piercing hearts and that you're ministering to people that are here. And that, Father, we remember to be thankful for you, for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for all that you've done for us. I thank you for your anointing and your presence that is here today. That, Father, that people are healed. They be at peace, Father God, just by coming in the doors of your house today, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, the title of my message is Thankful. Not original, I know. It's Thanksgiving. But 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 22, it says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every e form of evil." So in this passage, this is Paul, he concludes the letter to the church of Thessalonica, and he's with closing exhortations, and he is saying what believers ought to do and to be. But in the middle of it, he lists something that's extremely important. He said, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you. So that's our instruction. We th see that thanksgiving is a lifestyle that must be developed and continually cultivated. It must be something we continually work at. You don't just have one time of being thankful, but you're supposed to live thankful. This is the only way we will be equipped to give thanks in all things. So whether we find ourselves in good times or in bad times, we have to develop an attitude of gratitude and to be thankful. Thanksgiving is more than just an annual holiday. Amen. We need to live thanks living instead of thanksgiving. It needs to be something we continually work at. 
we're not able to achieve God's will without a lifestyle of thankfulness. Our attitude is your disposition. Have you ever met somebody with a bad, you can, t- your disposition is just your countenance. Have you ever met somebody with a bad disposition? Well, you know, that's how people measure you and your attitude is by your disposition. Our disposition says more about us and does more to create our image than anything that we say and any action that we do. It's just your presence, your countenance, your disposition. This is not only true in the, spirit, in the natural, but it's also true in your spiritual walk. Our attitude is a reflection of our spiritual condition. So your countenance, how you're walking about, just you standing there speaks volumes of your spiritual condition and of your walk with God. It's imperative that we develop a disposition of thankfulness. You know, if our disposition ultimately determines our position in the kingdom of God, you've heard that saying, attitude, what is it, the attitude, the altitude? Altitude, your attitude determines your altitude, thank you. That wasn't in my notes, that's why. (laughs) But it also determines, your disposition also determines if God's able to use you or not. And we limit God by our having a bad disposition. If we want to go higher in the kingdom, if we want God to be able to use us, then we must elevate our attitude. And developing a thankful spirit will empower you. And it will empower you to be faithful. And then that way, God is able to use you. He can't use people that are not faithful. One of the foundational characteristics of the disciples that followed Jesus was their faithfulness. You know, faithfulness is a key principle in the kingdom. Jesus told us that, you know, he can't make us ruler over, he's going to give us a little bit. And when we can rule over this and we can be faithful with this, then he can give more to us. We can't handle something bigger if we can't handle little. You know, it's like parents with your kids. Well, you're going to start giving them trust. You're going to start, okay, I'm a, we're going to trust you this much. Now, if you can do this and be home on time when we tell you to be home, Slade Sullivan, then you get, you get more. We can extend more, and you get more, and you, you earn trust. Well, the truth is that we don't have the grounds to ask God for bigger things until we have been proven faithful over small things. To be a true disciple, it requires a denying of self and the abandonment of preoccupations in order to follow Jesus, to follow him fully. Now, this does not mean that you can't work, you sit at home, and you hold your Bible, and you read your Bible, and you listen to Christian TV, and you can't do anything else because you are doing nothing but following Jesus. That's not what that means. You can live your life. God wants you to live your life. He wants you to go out and to work and into your, your life and touch people and tell him, them about him. But what it means is, is that everything else doesn't take priority over him and his kingdom. There's an order to things. We are required to be faithful because God is faithful. Hasn't he been faithful to you? He's faithful, so therefore we need to be faithful to him. And it's being thankful that will empower you to remain faithful. In 2 Timothy 1.12, It says, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. That is a powerful statement by Paul. He explained to Timothy that he was thankful for the Lord finding him faithful and putting him in the ministry. Are you not, are you, are you thankful to God that he's faithful to you? And that you're, everybody's in the ministry. You're in a ministry, whether you're in a ministry on your job, you know, we're all serving in the house. That's your ministry. We're all called to be faithful to his ministry. He acknowledged that it was his faithfulness that led him to 
to his appointment in ministry, and it was his faithfulness that would keep him in the ministry. This is where his thankfulness was essential. So being thankful for what God has done in his life, and then he was thankful to be able to serve in the ministry, and he was thankful to God, who the pe- who people that put in his care, that he got to minister to. And it kept him faithful, because he was thankful. And that proves that this provides a great reminder for all of us today to be thankful. We must be thankful for what God has done, thankful for how he's blessed us, and thankful for allowing him to let us serve in his kingdom. We got to be thankful. If we stop being thankful, then we will stop being faithful. So I'm going to give you three points about what I'm thankful for. Number one is God's house. I love God's house. I love this church. This is God's house, and I'm thankful for it. And I'm thankful that my husband and I and our family get to be the pastors and get to minister and serve you. We are thankful for that. You cannot truly love God and not have a heart for his house. If you love the Lord, then you love his house. Jesus is building his church, and I'm thankful that I get to be a part of his house. Amen. You know, and there's nobody in Scripture that embodies this more than King David. He was known after a man after God's own heart. Now, he had a lot of problems, which should encourage you. (laughs) You know what? God can use anybody. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. Maybe you have to, it's a continual thing. It's a continual thing being thankful. It's a continual thing asking God to forgive you and keep picking yourself up and moving on. So God used David, and that ought to help every one of us. But, you know, people think of his testimony as was just a desire to be in God's presence. And it was. But, you know, we often overlook that it was also a desire to be in God's house. David had a desire to be in God's presence and in his house. It would have been impossible for David to be a man after God's own heart and not love his house. Impossible. In Psalm 69, 9, it says, zeal for your house has consumed me. In Psalms 42, 4, I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise. At the beginning of uh, Psalms 42, it says, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. And who knew we were going to sing that today? God's good. Part of the quenching of the thirst for God's presence was coming into the house with joy and with praise. Psalms 26, 8 and 12, or verse 8 and 12. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. And verse 12 My foot stands in an even place in the congregation. I will bless the Lord. So David's love for God and his house were inseparable. They were one and the same. This is what led to David's passion to build build God's house in Jerusalem. And he says in Samuel 2, 7, it says he expressed to the prophet Nathan, he he was bothered by the fact that he lived in a palace that was made of cedar, and yet God's presence dwelt away from them behind curtains. He desired to build God a house. Why? Because he desired God's presence. Now, some people say, well, God's presence is wherever I am because God's in me. Well, that's true. But it also says not to forsake the, the assembling of yourselves together. It's important to come together to worship the Lord. And you're more powerful together than you are by yourself. This should be the same response from God's people today, a love for God and a love for his house. Be thankful for God, what God will manifest in your thanksgiving for his house. You know, just like David, we should always work to make things better and to build and continually building for God's house. You know, we know the story where David, a pastor shared this uh, a couple weeks ago, 
we talked about David was not able to build. God told him he wouldn't be able to build the, the a house for God, but his son would. So what did he do? He made all the preparations for him. If he wasn't able to do, be the actual builder, he was going to get everything together and get it in place. In 1 Chronicles 29, 1 and 3, it says, Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great because the temple is not for man but for the Lord God. Now, for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, and iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my aff affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. So he had a desire to build it. So he made all the preparations and got everything together to give it to his son so that it would be ready. So as soon as Solomon took the throne, he was able to start building God's house. Why was David consumed with a love for God's house? Why would you be consumed with it? Because he loved God and he knew the, the Lord's house was a place of prayer. Surge is a place of prayer. It's a place of worship. It's a place of refuge. It's a place for the voice of God. David understood how God's people can be changed by loving and properly treating the house of God. You can be changed. Church will change you. It's supposed to change you. In Psalms 92.1, it says, it, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. The, righteousness, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. I'm thankful for this house. I'm thankful that if you're broken, if you need healing, if you're if you lack anything, if your marriage is in trouble, if your kids are in trouble, if your family is not serving the Lord, this is a place that you can come to. And that's where you find healing. And it's a refuge. It's a place of refuge. You ought to look at it as that. It's a place of refuge for you, for your family, for your loved ones. Knowing this fact ought to cause us to be more passionate about the house of God. We and our families will flourish when we allow ourselves to be planted in the house. Your family will flourish. God is still building his house, and I am thankful that he's allowing me to be a part of building his house. Amen? He's allowing you to be a part of building his house. I got a lot of scriptures for you today, so listen up. But it's the word, amen. In 1 Peter 2, 5, it says, Ye also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are living stones, and God desires to use us to build his house. It takes all of us. We can't afford to be unthankful and ungrateful for this house. You can't afford to be. If we become unthankful, then we become unfaithful. And we're not able, God's not able to use us like he wants to use us. So we have to be thankful for his house. Number two is I'm thankful for the people of God. Don't you love people? We love people. Jesus loves people. Even the unlovable people, Jesus loves them. And he's called us to love them. I'm thankful for God's people. God's house would not be the same without God's people. It wouldn't be the same without you. His people are living stones, and he chooses to to use us to build his house. He's choosing to use you to build his house. 
Therefore, we are obligated, you are obligated to love God's people. Yes. It's not that you get to choose who you like and who you, lo- who you love, who you don't love, who you like, who you don't want to talk to. God's called you to love his people. Just as the Apostle Peter told us that we are living stones in God's house, he also commanded how we are to respond to one another. In 1 Peter 1.22, it says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. We are to love one another with a pure heart and fervently. A pure heart is loving people without ulterior motives. Without them thinking, what they, can they do for you? Well, if they can't do anything for me, I don't want to love them. It's loving people no matter what they can do for you. And this is a good one. First Peter 2.17, it says, Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. You know, one thing that's missing in our culture today is honor. We don't, you need to teach your kids to honor and respect people. You know, honor, it's also seeped into the church. There's a lack of honor. You know, I love the part where it says, love the brotherhood. What's the brotherhood? What's the surge people? It's surge. That's your brotherhood, where you come and get fed. In God's house, it's surge people. That's your brotherhood. And you can't love your brotherhood brotherhood without a healthy respect and honor for each other. So you need to honor and respect God's people. If you can't, if you cannot honor others, you cannot love others, which means that you can't love and honor God properly. You know, when you have people that you have, you know, you love God, oh, I love God, all that. But if you don't show action to it by loving his people, then you're not really showing honor to him because he's, he's commanded you to love his people. In Romans 12, 10, it says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. You know, the apostle Paul gave the same, uh, admonition to the church. He's explained that we are to be kindly affectionate to one another, which requires us to give honor and prefer one another. One of the reasons that we are obligated to the house of God is because we're obligated to each other. We're here for each other. We need to be accountable to each other. Our faithfulness to God's house is just not based on our schedule or our feelings. But it's out of the obligation that we have for each other. It's not about just what works out for you. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. God has a big vision, and it's bigger than just you. That means we got to treat each other with honor, respect, and love. And we got to be willing to protect each other. In Proverbs 17, 9, it says, He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. One of the ways that we seek love among God's people is to cover their transgressions and and mistakes and not try to exploit them. We do this by not repeating. (laughs) And now, I don't know why, ladies, don't get on to me. I still want to be in the girl club, but it seems to be that it's usually gossiping is more of a problem among ladies. I don't know why. It's because we like to get together and talk. But you can't be a gossiper because that, that, that's not loyalty. That causes division. And, you know, it, when, if somebody is talking to you about somebody else or, or talking, gossiping, whatever, it says a lot more about the person who's, who's repeating it and telling you than it does about who they're talking about. It says a lot about them. You know, and some people are so miserable with themselves that they cannot help but get into other people's business. Wisdom tells us to keep the bond of brotherhood by covering for one another. It says not to sow division and break bonds. 
It's important that you don't sow division in God's house. Don't repeat something you shouldn't be repeating. Don't listen to people when they want to come and talk to you about somebody else. Proverbs 16, 28 says, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisper separates the best of friends. You know, it's amazing to see what God considers perverse. The Scripture's clear that it's perverse to sow strife. Gossiping does not lead to anything but strife and division. And God calls you perverse. We don't want to be that way. You know, and it's amazing that something as a simple whisper, just saying something little about somebody, what it can, the damage that it can do. But we're living stones, and we're here to build each other up and build God's house up. We're stronger and better together. When you give ear to a whisper, God counts you among those that are sowing division. Even if you don't repeat it, don't listen to it. Don't be a part of that because you're counted in with that. God still considers that perverse. We must rise above strife of others and be the ones who sow harmony, honor, respect, love. We're here to, to get it done together. These ingredients, amen, we are. We're here to, to get it done together. These ingredients make the glue that causes living stones to stick together. If we stop being thankful for each other, then we stop being faithful to each other. You know, when I was younger, I would fight with my brother. And I know you can't believe it, but I was mean. <laughs> really mean. <laughs> and I may be a touch sarcastic so that added to that and being young. Um, so when I would not so love, as my mom would call it, she would make me read the love scriptures in Corinthians. First, she'd make me hug him. It was only him that I had a problem with. She would make me hug him, and then I would have to repeat the love scriptures. She said it was just reminding me of the love of God. <laughs> and, you know, I guess it worked. I grew out of it. Maybe, <laughs> you know. My husband said I didn't grow out of the sarcastic part, but <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 13, it reminds us that of the love of God. It endures all things. It bears all things. But in the end, it never fails. Love never fails. God's love never fails. And the love that he's given you to have for your surge people will never fail. And number three is being used by God as a vessel. We're thankful for the house. When we're thankful for God's people. Then we can be used as a vessel. It's easy to forget what an honor it is to be able to serve in the house. You know, you get, okay, our dog was throwing up all night. So, and I'm thinking, I got to get up and preach in the morning. She has to sleep in her cage. She's scraping around, making noise all night long. Nobody hears it but me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm thankful I get to get up and preach in the morning. It's great. But you know, things happen. Then you're getting everybody around in the morning and you're getting this, and you got to get here because you got to be a greeter at the front door, or you got to serve in the cafe, or you've got to sing, uh, you know, lead worship. And bring people into God's presence or run the sound, run the cameras, whatever. Teach children's church, work in the nursery, work in the toddler class. Bless their hearts. But you know what? It's easy to forget what an honor it is to get to serve in God's house. It can be easy to forget when you're on the cleaning team and you come in and you clean that nobody even sees you here. We have faithful, faithful teams here at Surge, and your pastor and I really appreciate <laughs> your faithfulness. In all seriousness, we appreciate we We can't do it without you, and we appreciate your faithfulness and your dedication. But when we forget to be thankful for that, it causes us to not remain faithful. 
when we have a choice to be vessels of honor or vessels of dishonor. In 2 Timothy 2.20, it says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself in the, from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. When we stop being thankful for God's house and for his people that he's placed in our lives, then we become unfaithful to those things. We want to be found faithful. That causes you to become a vessel of dishonor instead of a vessel of honor. When we allow our hearts and our ears and our mouths to become trash cans and whispers and gossips, then we limit how God can use us. Because just because you personally don't like somebody, that's still God's child. That's still his daughter. That's still his son. We must be thankful that God graces us with the honor to use us so that we can be found faithful in his service to him. And you know, why do we do all those things? Why Why do we come in here and we do coffee and greet at the door and do all that? Why? Because it's about... It's about building God's house. It's about telling people about Jesus. Why? Because the world is full of hurting people that are going through a lot. This isn't just a club for us to come together. We're doing all these things for a purpose. So don't forget that purpose and be thankful for it, the opportunity to be able to serve in God's house. Amen. Daniel 1-2 says, And the Lord gave... Joachim, king of Judah, into his hands with some of the vessels of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shamar, to the house of his God, and placed his, the vessels in the treasury of his God. There is always a Nebuchadnezzar spirit that's seeking to remove the vessels of God from the house. We must remain vigilant. We must be, remain in place and be willing to protect God's people, protect our house by being thankful for God's house, being thankful for his people, and, be, and being willing to be able to be used by him. Be thankful for the opportunities, no matter what the opportunity is. Be thankful for it, that you get to serve in God's house. Amen. If you stay thankful, you will stay faithful. If you're not thankful, you'll forget to be faithful. We want to be thankful. This is a perfect message since it is Thanksgiving. But we want to be thanks living and remind ourselves. Everybody can stand. Remind yourself why you're thankful. Why are you thankful? I'm thankful because you're here for more than a per. You're here, God, you're on this earth for more than to get up, go to work, and just be about what your family's doing. You're here for people. It's a bigger vision than just. You need to get a bigger vision than just that. It's about serving, serving God, and serving His people. Amen. Well, Father, you know, first of all, I want you just to lift your hands. And ask God, say, Father, forgive me if I've not always remembered to be thankful. I want to be found faithful. I thank you, Father, that you've given me the Holy Spirit to bring to my remembrance, to help me to be faithful, to be thankful. It's an honor, God, to serve you, to serve your house, and to serve your people. Now just tell him, give him thanks. Father God, we just praise you. He's faithful to you.
Thank you, Father, for your goodness, your mercy. You'll never find anyone that loves you like your Father does. Father, we thank you for just your love, your peace, your strength, your healing. We just praise you, Father, and we thank you. We're thankful for you, Father. We love you, Lord. Amen. I want to give you the opportunity now for those online or here in service, if you've never given your heart to the Lord, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and to serve Him, I want you to raise your hand. Well, let's all repeat it together. Lord, I repent of my sins. I'm asking you to come into my life. Come into my heart. Wash me new. Make me clean. I want your abundant life living on the inside of me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me that I may live. I make you the Lord of my life. Amen. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for sharing the ministry of Surge Church with your friends and family and on social media. We love you and cannot wait to see you. Stay connected together. We will surge.